Chapter 9 of Masters of Space by E. E. Doc Smith and E. Everett Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Masters of Space, Chapter 9. As has been intimated, no Terran can know what researches Larry and Tula and the other Omen specialists performed, or how they arrived at the conclusions they reached. However, in less than a week, Larry reported to Hilton. It can be done, sir, with complete safety, and you will live even more comfortably than you do now. How long? The mean will be about five thousand omen years. You don't know that an omen year is equal to one point two nine three plus Terran years? I didn't, no. Thanks. The maximum a little less than six thousand. The minimum a little over four thousand. I'm very sorry we had no data upon which to base a closer estimate. Close enough. He stared at the omen. You could also convert my wife? Of course, sir. Well, we might be able to stand it, after we got used to the idea. Minimum over five thousand Terran years. Barring accidents, of course. No, sir, no accidents. Nothing will be able to kill you except by total destruction of the brain. And even then, sir, there will be the pattern. I'll be damned. Hilton gulped twice. Okay, go ahead. Your skins will be like ours, energy absorbers. Your blood will carry charges of energy instead of oxygen. Thus you may breathe or not as you please. Unless you wish otherwise, we will continue the breathing function. It would scarcely be worth while to alter the automatic mechanisms that now control it. And you will wish at times to speak. You will still enjoy eating and drinking, although everything ingested will be eliminated, as at present, as waste. We'd add urine excite to our food, I suppose, or drink radioactives, or sleep under cobalt-60 lamps. Yes, sir. Your family life will be normal, your sexual urges and satisfactions the same, fertilization and period of gestation unchanged. Your children will mature at the same ages as they do now. How do you... Oh, I see. You wouldn't change any molecular linkages or configurations in the genes or chromosomes. We could not, sir, even if we wished. Such substitutions can be made only in exact one-for-one -one replacements. In the near future you will, of course, have to control births quite rigorously. We sure would. Let's see. Say we want a stationary population of a hundred million on our planet each couple to have two children, a boy and a girl, born when the parents are about fifty. Um, the gals can have all the children they want, then, until our population is about a million, then slap on the limit of two kids per couple, right? Approximately so, sir. And after conversion, you alone will be able to operate with the full power of your eight without tiring. You will also, of course, be able to absorb almost instantaneously all the knowledges and abilities of the old masters. Hilton gulped twice before he could speak. You wouldn't be holding anything else back, would you? Nothing important, sir. Everything else is minor, and probably known to you. I doubt it. How long will the job take, and how much notice will you need? Two days, sir. No notice. Everything is ready. Hilton, face somber, thought for minutes. The more I think of it, the less I like it. But it seems to be a forced put, and Temple will blow sky high. And have I got the guts to go it alone, even if she'd let me? He shrugged himself out of the black mood. I'll look her up and let you know, Larry. He looked her up and told her everything. Told her bluntly, starkly drawing the full picture in jet black with very little white. There it is, sweetheart, the works, he concluded. We're not going to have ten years. We may not have ten months. So, if such a brain as that can be had, do we or do we not have to have it? I'm putting it squarely up to you. Temple's face, which had been getting paler and paler, was now as nearly colorless as it could become the sickly yellow of her skin's light tan unbacked by any flush of red blood. Her whole body was tense and strained. There's a horrible snapper on that question. Can't I do it? 
Or anybody else except you? No. Anyway, whose job is it, sweetheart? I know, but... But I know just how close Tuli came to killing you, and that wasn't anything compared to such a radical transformation as this. I'm afraid it'll kill you, darling, and I just simply couldn't stand it. She threw herself into his arms, and he comforted her in the ages old fashion of man with maid. Steady, hun, he said, as soon as he could lift her tear streaked face from his shoulder. I'll live through it. I thought you were getting the howling halpers about having to live for six thousand years and never getting back to Terra except for a Q strictly T visit now and then. She pulled away from him, flung back her wheaten mop, and glared. So that's what you thought. What do I care how long I live, or how, or where, as long as it's with you? And what makes you think we can possibly live through such a horrible conversion as that? Larry wouldn't do it if there was any question whatever. He didn't say it would be painless, but he did say I'd live. Well, he knows, I guess. I hope. Temple's natural fine color began to come back but it's understood that just the second you come out of the vat, I go right in. I had not to let you, of course, but I don't think I could take it alone. That statement required a special type of conference, which consumed some little time. Eventually, however, Temple answered it in words. Of course you couldn't, sweetheart, and I wouldn't let you, even if you could. There were a few things that had to be done before those two secret conversions could be made. There was the matter of the wedding, which was now to be in quadruplicate. Arrangements had to be made so that eight big wheels of the project could all be away on honeymoon at once. All these things were done. Of the conversion operations themselves, nothing more need be said. The honeymooners, having left ship and town on a Friday afternoon, came back one week from the following Monday morning. While it took some time to recompute the exact Ardrian calendar, Terran day names and Terran weeks were used from the first. The omens manufactured watches, clocks, and chronometers, which divided the Ardrian day into twenty-four Ardrian hours, with minutes and seconds as usual. The eight met joyously in Bachelor's Hall, the girls kissing each other and the men indiscriminately and enthusiastically, the men cooperating zestfully. Temple scarcely blushed at all. She was so engrossed in trying to find out whether or not anyone was noticing any change. No one seemed to notice anything out of the ordinary. So finally she said, "'Don't any of you really see anything different?' The six others all howled at that, and Sandra, between giggles and snorts, said, "'No, precious, it doesn't show a bit. Did you really think it would?' Temple blushed furiously, and Hilton came instantly to his bride's rescue. "'Chip-chop the comedy, gang.' She and I aren't human any more. We're a good jump toward being omens. I couldn't make her believe it doesn't show. That stopped the levity cold, but none of the six could really believe it. However, after Hilton had coiled a twenty-penny spike into a perfect helix between his fingers, and especially after he and Temple had each chewed up and swallowed a piece of uranexite, there were no grounds left for doubt. That settles it. It tears it. Karn said then. Start all over again, Jarve. We'll listen this time. Hilton told the long story again, and added, I had to rework a couple of cells of Temple's brain, but now she can read and understand the records as well as I can. So I thought I'd take her place on Team One and let her boss the job on all the other teams. Okay? So you don't want to let the rest of us in on it. Karn's level of stare was a far cry from the way he had looked at his chief a moment before. If there's any one thing in the universe I'd never had you figured for, it's a dog in the manger. Huh? You mean you actually want to be a... a... Hell, we don't even know what we are. I do want it, Jarvis. We all do. This was, of all people, Teddy. No one in all history has had more than about fifty years of really productive thinking, and just the idea of having enough time. Hold it, Teddy. Use your brain. The masters couldn't take it. They committed suicide. How do you figure we can do any better? Because we'll use our brains, she snapped. 
They didn't. The omens will serve us, and that's all they'll do. And do you think you'll be able to raise your children and grandchildren and so on to do the same? To have guts enough to resist a pull of such an ungodly habit-forming drug as this omen service is? I'm sure of it. She nodded positively. And we'll run all applicants through a fine enough screen to— that is, if we ever consider anybody except our own Busai people. And there's another reason. She grinned, got up, wriggled out of her coverall, and posed in bra and panties. Look, I can keep most of this for five years, quite a lot of it for ten. Then comes the struggle. What do you think I do for the ability, whenever it begins to get wrinkly or flabby, to peel the whole thing off and put on a brand spanking new smooth one? You name it, I'll do it. Besides, Bill and I will both just simply and cold-bloodedly murder you if you try to keep us out. Okay. Hilton looked at Temple, she looked at him. Both looked at all the others. There was no revulsion at all, nothing but eagerness. Temple took over. I'm surprised. We're both surprised. You see, Jarv didn't want to do it at all, but he had to. I not only didn't want to, I was scared green and yellow at just the idea of it. But I had to, too, of course. We didn't think anybody would really want to. We thought we'd be left here alone. We still will be, I think, when you've thought it clear through, Teddy. You just haven't realized yet that we aren't even human any more. We're simply nothing but monsters. Temple's voice became a wail. I've said my piece, Teddy said. You tell him, Bill. Let me say something first, Kincaid said. Temple, I'm ashamed of you. This line isn't at all your usual straight thinking. What you actually are is homo superior. Bill? I can add one bit to that. I don't wonder that you were scared silly, Temple. Utterly new concept, and you went into it stone cold. But now we see the finished product, and we like it. In fact, we drool. I'll say we're drooling, Sandra said. I could do handstands and pinwheels with joy. Let's see you, Hilton said. That we'd all get a kick out of. Not now. Don't want to hold this up. But sometime I just will. Bev? I'm for it. And how? And won't Bernadine be amazed? Beverly laughed gleefully at her wisecrack about the race to end all human races coming true. "'I am in favor of it, too, one hundred percent,' Pointer said. "'Has it occurred to you, Jarv, that this opens up intergalactic exploration? No supplies to carry, and plenty of time and fuel?' "'No, it hadn't. You've got a point there, Frank. That may take a little of the curse off it at that. "'When some of our kids get to be twenty years old or so and get married,' I'm going to take a crew of them to Andromeda. We'll arrange, then, to extend our honeymoons another week," Hilton said. What will our policy be? Keep it dark for a while with just us eight, or spread it to the rest? Spread it, I'd say, Kincaid said. We can't keep it a secret anyway, Teddy argued. Since Larry and Tooley were in on the whole deal, every omen on the planet knows all about it. Somebody is going to ask questions, and omens always answer questions and always tell the truth. "'Questions have already been asked and answered,' Larry said, going to the door and opening it. Stella rushed in. "'We've been hearing the damnedest things!' She kissed everybody, ending with Hilton, whom she seized by both shoulders. "'Is it actually true, boss, that you can fix me up so I'll live practically forever and can eat more than eleven calories a day without getting fat as a pig?' Candy, ice cream, cake, pie, eclairs, cream puffs, French pastries, sugar, and gobs of thick cream in my coffee? Half a dozen others, including the Vandermoen twins, came in. Beverly emitted a shriek of joy. Bernadine, the mother of the race to end all human races. You whistled it, Bertie, Bernadine caroled. I'm going to have ten or twelve, each one weirder than all the others. I told you I was a prophet. I'm going to hang out my shingle. Wholesale and retail prophecy. Special rates for large parties. Her voice was drowned out in a general clamor. Hold it, everybody, Hilton yelled. Chip-chop it. 
Quit it! Then, as the noise subsided, If you think I'm going to tell this tall tale over and over again for the next two weeks, you're all crazy. So shut down the plant and get everybody out here. Not everybody, Jarve, Temple snapped. We don't want scum, and there's some of that even in Busai. You're so right. Who then? The rest of the heads and assistants, of course, and all the lab girls and their husbands and boyfriends. I know they are all okay. That will be enough for now, don't you think? I do think. And the indicated others were sent for, and in a few minutes arrived. The omens brought chairs, and Hilton stood on a table. He spoke for ten minutes. Then, Before you decide whether you want to or not, think it over very carefully, because it's a one-way street. Florine cannot be displaced. Once in, you're stuck for life. There is no way back. I have told you all the drawbacks and disadvantages I know of, but there may be a lot more that I haven't thought of yet. So think it over for a few days, and when each of you has definitely made up his or her mind, let me know. He jumped down off the table. His listeners, however, did not need days or even seconds to decide. Before Hilton's feet hit the floor, there was a yell of unanimous approval. He looked at his wife. Do you suppose we're nuts? Uh-uh, not a bit. Alex was right. I'm going to just love it. She hugged his elbow ecstatically. So are you, darling, as soon as you stop looking at only the black side. You know, you could be right. For the first time since the ghastly transformation, Hilton saw that there really was a bright side and began to study it. With most of Busai, and part of the Navy, and selectees from Terra, it will be slightly terrific at that. And that habit-forming drug objection isn't insuperable, darling, Temple said. If the younger generations start weakening, we'll fix the omens. I wouldn't want to wipe them out entirely, but— but how do we settle priority, Dr. Hilton? a girl called out, a tall, striking brunette laboratory technician whose name Hilton needed a second to recall. By pulling straws or hair? Or by shooting dice or each other or what? Thanks, Betty. You've got a point. Sandy Cummings and department heads first, then assistants, then you girls in alphabetical order, each with her own husband or fiancé. And my name is Ames. Oh, goody! Larry, please tell them to— I already have, sir. We are set up to handle four at once. Good boy. So scat, all of you, and get back to work. Except Sandy, Bill, Alex, and Teddy. You four, go with Larry. Since the new sense was not Peondix, Hilton had started calling it perception, and the others adopted the term as a matter of course. Hilton had used that sense for what seemed like years— and actually was whole minutes, at a time without fatigue or strain. He could not, however, nor could the omens, give his tremendous power to anyone else. As he had said, he could do a certain amount of reworking, but the amount of improvement possible to make depended entirely upon what there was to work on. Thus Temple could cover about six hundred light-years. It developed later that the others of the Big Eight could cover from one hundred up to four hundred or so. The other department heads and assistants turned out to be still weaker, and not one of the rank and file ever became able to cover more than a single planet. This sense was not exactly telepathy, at least not what Hilton had always thought telepathy would be. If anything, however, it was more. It was a lumping together of all five known human senses, and half a dozen unknown ones called, collectively, intuition, into one super-sense that was all-inclusive and all-informative. If he ever could learn exactly what it was, and exactly what it did, and how it did it, but he better chip-chop the wool-gathering and get back onto the job. The Strets had licked the old masters very easily, and intended to wipe out the omens and the humans. They had no doubt at all as to their ability to do it. Maybe they could. If the masters had made some progress that the omens didn't know about, they probably could. That was the first thing to find out. As soon as they'd been converted, he'd call in all the experts, and they'd go through the master's records like a dose of salts through a hillbilly schoolma'am. At that point in Hilton's cogitations, Sawtell came in. He had come down in his gig, 
to confer with Hilton as to the newly beefed-up fleet. Instead of being glum and pessimistic and foreboding, he was chipper and enthusiastic. They had rebuilt a thousand Omen ships. By combining Omen and Terran science, and adding everything the first team had been able to reduce to practice, they had hyped up the power by a good fifteen per cent. Seven hundred of those ships, and all his men, were now arrayed in defense around Ardree. Three hundred, manned by omens, were around the fuel bin. Why? Hilton asked. It's fuel bin they've been attacking. Uh uh, minor objective, the captain demurred positively. The real attack will be here at you, the headquarters and the brains. Then fuel bin will be duck soup. But the thing that pleased me most is the control. Man, you never imagined such control. No admiral in history ever had such control of ten ships as I have of seven hundred. Those omens spread orders so fast that I don't even finish thinking one and it's being executed. And no misunderstandings, no slips. For instance, this last batch, fifteen skeletons. Far out, they're getting cagey. I just thought, box em in and slug em, and in, across, out, sockle, pfft, just like that and just that fast. None of them had time to light a beam. Nobody before ever even dreamed of such control. That's great, and I like it. And you're only a captain. How many ships can five-jet Admiral Gordon put into space? That depends on what you call ships. Super Dreadnoughts, Perseus class, six. First line battleships, twenty-nine. Second line, smaller and some pretty old, seventy-three. Counting everything armed that would hold air, something over two hundred. I thought it was something like that. How would you like to be five-jet Admiral Sautel of the Ardrian Navy? I wouldn't. I'm Terran Navy. But you knew that, and you know me. So, what's on your mind? Hilton told him. I ought to put this on tape, he thought to himself, and broadcast it every hour on the hour. They took the old masters like dynamiting fish in a barrel, he concluded, and I'm damned afraid they're going to lick us unless we take a lot of big, fast steps. But the hell of it is that I can't tell you anything, not one single thing, about any part of it. There's simply no way at all of getting through to you without making you over into the same kind of a thing I am. Is that bad? Sawtell was used to making important decisions fast. Let's get at it. Huh? Skipper, do you realize just what that means? If you think they'll let you resign, forget it. They'll crucify you, brand you as a traitor, and God only knows what else. Right. How about you and your people? Well, as civilians, it won't be as bad. The hell it won't. Every man and woman that stays here will be posted forever as the blackest traitors old Terra ever disgraced herself by spawning. You've got a point there at that. We'll all have to bring our relatives, the ones we think much of at least, out here with us. Definitely. Now see what you can do about getting me run through your mill. By exerting his authority, Hilton got Sautel put through the preservatory in the second batch processed. Then, linking minds with the captain, he flashed their joint attention to the hall of records. Into the right room. Into the right chest. Along miles and miles of braided wire, carrying some of the profoundest military secrets of the ancient masters. Then, now you know a little of it, Hilton said, maybe a thousandth of what we'll have to have before we can take the stretch as they will have to be taken. For seconds Sawtell could not speak. Then, my God, I see what you mean. You're right. No omens can ever go to Terra and no Terrans can ever come here except to stay forever. The two then went out into space to the flagship, which had been christened the Orion, and called in the six commanders. "'What is all this senseless idiocy we've been getting, Jarve?' Elliot demanded. Hilton eyed all six with pretended disfavor. "'You six guys are the hardest-headed bunch of skeptics that ever went unhung,' he remarked dispassionately so it wouldn't do any good to tell you anything, yet. The skipper and I will show you a thing first. Take her away, Skip. The Orion shot away under interplanetary drive, and for several hours 
Hilton and Sautel worked at rewiring and practically rebuilding two devices that no one, omen or human, had touched since the Perseus had landed on Ardri. "'What are you—' "'I don't understand what you are doing, sir,' Larry said. For the first time since Hilton had known him, the omen's mind was confused and unsure. "'I know you don't. This is a bit of top-secret master stuff. Maybe, some day, we'll be able to rework your brain to take it. But it won't for some time.' End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Masters of Space by E. E. Doc Smith and E. Everett Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Masters of Space, Chapter Ten. The Orion hung in space, a couple of thousands of miles away from an asteroid which was perhaps a mile in average diameter. Hilton straightened up. Put triple X black filters on your plates and watch that asteroid. The commanders did so. Ready? he asked. Ready, sir. Hilton didn't move a muscle. Nothing actually moved. Nevertheless, there was a motionlessly writhing and crawling distortion of the ship and everything in it, accompanied by a sensation that simply cannot be described. It was not like going into or emerging from sub ether. It was not even remotely like space sickness or seasickness or free fall or anything else that any Terran had ever before experienced and the asteroid vanished. It disappeared into an outrageously incandescent, furiously pyrotechnic, raveningly expanding atomic fireball that in seconds seemed to fill half of space. After ages-long minutes of the most horrifyingly devastating fury any man there had ever seen, the frightful thing expired, and Hilton said, "'That was just a kind of firecracker.' just a feeble imitation of the first stage detonator for what we'll have to have to crack the Strat's ground-based screens. If the skipper and I had taken time to take the ship down to the shops and really work it over, we could have put on a show. This was enough so you ironheads are ready to listen with your ears open and your mouths shut. They were. So much so that not even Elliot opened his mouth to say yes. They merely nodded. Then again, for the last time he hoped, Hilton spoke his piece. The response was prompt and vigorous. Only Sam Bryant, one of Hilton's staunchest allies, showed any uncertainty at all. "'I've been married only a year and a half, and the baby was due about a month ago. How sure are you that you can make old Gordon sit still for us skimming the cream off of Terra to bring out here?' "'Doris Bryant, the cream of Terra,' Elliot jibed. "'How modest our Samuel has become!' "'Well, damn it, she is,' Bryant insisted. "'Okay, she is,' Hilton agreed. "'But either we get our people, or Terra doesn't get its year next site. That'll work. In the remote contingency that it doesn't, there are still tighter screws we can put on. But you missed the main snapper, Sam. Suppose Doris doesn't want to live for five thousand years, and is allergic to becoming a monster.' "'Huh, you don't have to worry about that.' Sam brushed that argument aside with a wave of his hand. "'Show me a girl who doesn't want to stay young and beautiful forever, and I'll square you the circle. Come on, what's holding us up?' The Orion hurtled through space back toward Ardri, and Hilton, struck by a sudden thought, turned to the captain. "'Skipper, why wouldn't it be a smart idea to clamp a blockade onto fuel bin? Cut the stretch fuel supply?' "'I thought better of you than that, son.' Sawtell shook his head sadly. That was the first thing I did. Ouch. Maybe you're way ahead of me, too, then, on the one that we should move to fuel bin, lock, stock, and barrel? Never thought of it, no. Maybe you're worth saving, after all. After conversion, of course. Yes, there'd be three big advantages. Four. Sawtell raised his eyebrows. One, only one planet to defend. Two, it's self-defending against sneak landings. Nothing remotely human can land on it except in heavy lead armor, and even in that can stay healthy for only a few minutes. Except in the city, Omlu, that's the weak point and would be the point of attack. Uh-uh. Cut off the decontaminators, and in five hours it'll be as hot as the rest of the planet. Three, 
there be no interstellar supply line for the stretch to cut. Four, the environment matches our new physiques a lot better than any normal planet could. That's the one I didn't think about. I think I'll take a quick peek at the struts. Uh-oh. They've screened their whole planet. Well, we can do that, too, of course. How are you going to select and reject personnel? It looks as though everybody wants to stay, even the men whose main object in life is to go aground and get drunk. The omens do altogether too good a job on them, and there's no such thing as a hangover. I'm glad I'm not in your boots. You may be in it up to the eyeballs, Skipper, so don't chortle too soon. Hilton had already devoted much time to the problem of selection, and he thought of little else all the way back to Ardree, and for several days afterward he held conferences with small groups and conducted certain investigations. Bud Carroll of sociology and his assistant Sylvia Bannister had been married for weeks. Hilton called them, together with Sawtell and Bryant of Navy, into conference with the Big Eight. "'The more I study this thing, the less I like it,' Hilton said. With a civilization having no government, no police, no laws, no medium of exchange—' "'No money?' Bryant exclaimed. "'How's old Gordon going to pay for his urinexite, then?' "'He gets it free,' Hilton replied flatly. "'When anyone can have anything he wants, merely by wanting it, what good is money? "'Now, remembering how long we're going to have to live, what we'll be up against, that the masters failed, and so on, it is clear that the prime basic we have to select for is stability. We twelve have, by psychodynamic measurement, the highest stability ratings available. Are you sure I belong here? Brian asked. Yes. Here are three lists. Hilton passed papers around. The list labeled OK names those I'm sure of, the ones we're converting now and their wives and whatever on Terra. List NG names the ones I know we don't want. List X, over thirty percent, are in-betweeners. We have to make a decision on the X list. So, what I want to know is, who's going to play God? I'm not. Sandy, are you? Good heavens, no! Sandra shuddered. But I'm afraid I know who will have to. I'm sorry, Alex, but it'll have to be you four, psychology and sociology. Six heads nodded, and there was a flashing interchange of thought among the four. Temple licked her lips and nodded, and Kincaid spoke. "'Yes, I'm afraid it's our baby. By leaning very heavily on Temple, we can do it. Remember, Jarv, what you said about the irresistible force? We'll need it. "'As I said once before, Mrs. Hilton, I'm very glad you're along,' Hilton said but just how sure are you that even you can stand up under the load? Alone, I couldn't, but don't underestimate Mrs. Carroll and the messieurs. Together, and with such a goal, I'm sure we can. Thus, after four-fifths of his own group and forty-one navy men had been converted, Hilton called an evening meeting of all the converts. Larry, Tooley, and Javi were the only omens present. You all knew, of course, that we were going to move to fuel bin some time, Hilton began. I can tell you now that we who are here are all there are going to be of us. We are all leaving for fuel bin immediately after this meeting. Everything of any importance, including all of your personal effects, has already been moved. All omens except those three, and all omen ships except the Orion, have already gone. He paused to let the news sink in. Thoughts flew everywhere. The irrepressible Stella Wing, now Mrs. Osbert F. Harkins, was the first to give tongue. "'What a wonderful job! Why, everybody's here that I really like at all!' That sentiment was, of course, unanimous. It could not have been otherwise. Betty, the ex-Ames, called out, "'How do you get their female omens away from Cecil Calthorpe and the rest of that chasing, booze-fighting bunch?' without them blowing the whole show. Some suasion was necessary, Hilton admitted, with a grin. Everyone who isn't here is time-locked into the Perseus. Release time, eight hours tomorrow. And they'll wake up tomorrow morning with no omens? Bernadine tossed back her silvery mane and laughed. Nor anything else except the Perseus? In a way, I'm sorry, but maybe I've got too much stinker-blood in me, but I'm very glad none of them are here. 
But I'd like to ask, Jarvis, or rather, I suppose you have already set up a new advisory board? We have, yes. Hilton read off twelve names. Oh, nice! I don't know of any people I'd rather have on it. But what I want to gripe about is calling our new homeworld such a horrible name as Fuel Bin, as though it were a wood box or a coal scuttle or something. And just think of the complexes it would set up in those super children we're going to have so many of. What would you suggest? Hilton asked. Ardvor, of course, Hermione said before her sister could answer. We've had Arth and Ardu and Ardri, and you, or somebody, started calling us Ardens to distinguish us converts from the Terrans. So let's keep up the same line. There was general laughter at that, but the name was approved. About midnight the meeting ended, and the Orion set out for Ardvor. It reached it and slanted sharply downward. The whole Busai staff was in the lounge, watching the big Tri-D. "'Hey, that isn't Omlu!' Stella exclaimed. "'It isn't a city at all, and it isn't even in the same place!' "'No, ma'am,' Larry said. Most of you wanted the ocean, but many wanted a river or the mountains. Therefore we raised Omlu and built your new city, Ardain, at a place where the ocean, two rivers, and a range of mountains meet. Strictly speaking, it is not a city, but a place of pleasant and rewardful living. The spaceship was coming in low and fast from the south. To the left, the west, there stretched the limitless expanse of ocean. To the right, mile after mile, were rough, rugged, jagged, partially timbered mountains, mass piled upon mass. Immediately below the speeding vessel was a wide, white sand beach, all of ten miles long. Slowing rapidly now, the Orion flew along due north. "'Look! Look! A natatorium!' Beverly shrieked. "'I know I wanted a nice big place to swim in, besides my backyard pool and the ocean, but I didn't tell anybody to build that. I swear I didn't!' "'You didn't have to, pet,' Pointer put his arm around her curvaceous waist and squeezed. "'They knew. And I did a little thinking along that line myself. There's our house, on top of the cliff over the natatorium. You can almost dive into it off the patio.' "'Oh, wonderful!' Immediately north of the natatorium a tremendous river, named at first sight the Whitewater, rushed through its gorge into the ocean a river and gorge strangely reminiscent of the Colorado and its Grand Canyon. On the south bank of that river, at its very mouth, looking straight up at the tremendous canyon, on a rocky promontory commanding ocean and beach and mountains, there was a house. At the sight of it Temple hugged Hilton's arm in ecstasy. "'Yes, that's ours,' he assured her. "'Just about everything either of us ever wanted.' The clamor was now so great. Everyone was recognized as his and her house and was exclaiming about it, that both Temple and Hilton fell silent and simply watched the scenery unroll. Across the turbulent whitewater and a mile farther north, the mountains ended as abruptly as though they had been cut off with a cleaver, and an apparently limitless expanse of treeless, grassy prairie began. And through that prairie, meandering sluggishly to the ocean from the northeast, came the wide, deep river Placid. The Orion halted. It began to descend vertically, and only then did Hilton see the spaceport. It was so vast, and there were so many spaceships on it, that from any great distance it was actually invisible. Each six-acre bit of the whole immense expanse of the level prairie between the Placid and the mountains held an omen super-dreadnought. The staff paired off and headed for the airlocks. Hilton said, "'Temple, have you any reservations at all, however slight, as to having Dark Lady as a permanent fixture in your home? Why, of course not. I like her as much as you do. And besides, she giggled like a schoolgirl, even if she is a lot more beautiful than I am, I've got a few things she never will have. But there's something else. I got just a flash of it before you blocked. Spill it, please. You'll see in a minute. And she did. Larry, Dark Lady, and Temple's omen maid, Modi, were standing beside the Hilton's car, and so was another omen, like none ever before seen. Six feet four, 
shoulders that would just barely go through a door, muscle like Atlantis and Hercules combined, skin a gleaming, satiny bronze, hair a rippling mass of lambent flame. Temple came to a full stop and caught her breath. The prince, she breathed in awe, Delorme's prince of Thebes, the ultimate bronze of all the ages. You did this, Jarve. How did you ever dig him up out of my schoolgirl crushes? All six got into the car, which was equally at home on land or water or in the air. In less than a minute they were at Hilton House. The house itself was circular. Its living room was an immense annulus of glass, from which, by merely moving along its circular length, any desired view could be had. The pair walked around at once. Then she took him by the arm and steered him firmly toward one of the bedrooms in the center. "'This house is just too much to take in all at once,' she declared. "'Besides, let's put on our swimsuits and get over to the gnat.' In the room she closed the door firmly in the faces of the omens and grinned. "'Maybe sometime I'll get used to having somebody besides you in my bedroom, but I haven't yet. Oh, do you itch, too?' Hilton had peeled to the waist and was scratching vigorously all around his waistline, under his belt. "'Like the very devil,' he admitted, and stared at her. For she, three-quarters stripped, was scratching, too. "'It started the minute we left the Orion,' he said thoughtfully. "'I see. These new skins of ours like hard radiation, but don't like to be smothered while they're enjoying it. By about tomorrow we'll be a nudist colony, I think.' I could stand it, I suppose. What makes you think so? Just what I know about radiation. Frank would be the one to ask. My hunch is, though, that we're going to be nudists whether we want to or not. Let's go. They went in a two-seater, leaving the omens at home. Three-quarters of the staff were lolling on the sand or were seated on benches beside the immense pool. As they watched, Beverly ran out among the line of springboards testing each one and selecting the stiffest. She then climbed up to the top platform, a good twelve feet above the board, and plummeted down upon the board's heavily padded takeoff. Legs and back bending stubbornly to take the strain, she and the board reached low point together, and, still in sync with it, she put every muscle she had into the effort to hurl herself upward. She had intended to go up thirty feet, but she had no idea whatever as to her present strength or of what that omen board, in perfect synchronization with that tremendous strength, would do. Thus, instead of thirty feet, she went up very nearly two hundred, which, of course, spoiled completely her proposed graceful two and a half. In mid-air she struggled madly to get into some acceptable position. Failing, she curled up into a tight ball just before she struck water. What a splash! It won't hurt her. You couldn't hurt her with a club, Hilton snapped. He seized Temple's hand as everyone else rushed to the pool's edge. Look, Bernadine, that's what I was thinking about. Temple stopped and looked. The platinum-haired twins had been basking in the sand, and wherever sand had touched fabric, fabric had disappeared. Their suits had, of course, approached the minimum to start with. Now Bernadine wore only a wisp of nylon perched precariously on one breast, and part of a ribbon that had once been a belt. Discovering the catastrophe, she shrieked once and leapt into the pool any which way, covering her breasts with her hands and hiding in water up to her neck. Meanwhile the involuntarily high diver had come to the surface, laughing apologetically. Surprised by the hair dangling down over her eyes, she felt for her cap. It was gone. So was her suit. Naked as a fish, she swam a couple of easy strokes, then stopped. "'Frank! Oh, Frank!' she called. "'Over here, Bev.' Her husband did not quite know whether to laugh or not. "'Is it the radiation or the water, or both?' "'Radiation, I think. These new skins of ours don't want to be covered up. But it probably makes the water a pretty good limitation of a universal solvent. "'Good-bye, clothes.' Beverly rolled over onto her back, fanned water carefully with her hands, and gazed approvingly at herself. "'I don't itch any more, anyway, so I'm very much in favor of it.' 
Thus the Ardens came to their new homeworld and to a life that was to be more comfortable by far and happier by far than any of them had known on earth. There were many other surprises that day, of course, of which only two will be mentioned here. When they finally left the pool, at about seventeen hours GMT, everybody was ravenously hungry. Greenwich, meantime, Ardvor was, always and everywhere, full daylight. Terran time and calendar were adapted as a matter of course. "'But why should we be?' Stella demanded. "'I've been eating everything in sight just for fun. But now I'm actually hungry enough to eat a horse and wagon and chase the driver.' "'Swimming makes everybody hungry,' Beverly said. "'And I'm awfully glad that hasn't changed. Why, I wouldn't feel human if I didn't.' Hilton and Temple went home, and had a long, drawn-out, and very wonderful supper. Prince waited on Temple, Dark Lady on Hilton. Larry and Modi ran the synthesizers in the kitchen. All four omens radiated happiness. Another surprise came when they went to bed. For the bed was a raised platform of something that looked like concrete, and except for an uncanny property of molding itself somewhat to the contours of their bodies, was almost as hard as rock. Nevertheless, it was the most comfortable bed either of them had ever had. When they were ready to go to sleep, Temple said, "'Drat it! Those omens still want to come in and sleep with us. In the room, I mean. And they suffer so. They're simply radiating silent suffering and oh-so-submissive reproach. Shall we let them come in?' "'That's strictly up to you, sweetheart.' "'It always has been. I know.' I thought they'd quit it sometime, but I guess they never will. I still want an illusion of privacy at times, even though they know all about everything that goes on. But we might let them in now, just while we sleep, and throw them out again as soon as we wake up in the morning. You're the boss. Without additional invitation, the four omens came in and arranged themselves neatly on the floor, on all four sides of the bed. Temple had barely time to cuddle up against Hilton and he to put his arm closely around her, before they both dropped into profound and dreamless sleep. At eight hours next morning all the specialists met at the new Hall of Records. This building, an exact duplicate of the old one, was located on a mesa in the foothill southwest of the natatorium, in a luxuriant grove at sight of which Carn stopped and began to laugh. "'I thought I'd seen everything,' he remarked. But yellow pine, spruce, tamarack, apples, oaks, palms, oranges, cedars, joshua trees, and cactus, just to name a few, all growing on the same quarter section of land? Just everything anybody wants is all, Hilton said. But are they really growing, or just straight synthetics? Lane, Kathy, this is your dish. Not so fast, Jarve. Give us a chance, please, Catherine, now Mrs. Lane Saunders, pleaded. She shook her spectacular head. "'We don't see how any stable indigenous life can have developed at all, unless—' "'Unless what? Natural shielding?' Hilton asked, and Kathy eyed her husband. "'Right,' Saunders said. "'The earliest life-forms must have developed a shield before they could evolve and stabilize. Hence, whatever it is that is in our skins was not a triumph of master science. They took it from nature.' "'Oh?' Oh! These were two of Sandra's most expressive monosyllables, followed by a third. Oh! Could be at that. But how could— No, cancel that. You'd better cancel it, Sandy. Give us a couple of months, and maybe we can answer a few elementary questions. Now inside the hall, all the teams, from astronomy to zoology, went efficiently to work. Everyone now knew what to look for, how to find it, and how to study it. "'The first team doesn't need you now too much, does it, Jarve?' Sawtell asked. "'Not particularly. In fact, I was just going to get back onto my own job. Not yet. I want to talk to you.' And the two went into a long discussion of naval affairs. End of chapter 10《ハプロー11マスターズ・オブ・スペース》by E. E. Doc Smith and E. Everett Evans。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。マスターズ・オブ・スペース。
Chapter 11 The Strett's fuel supply line had been cut long since. Many Strett cargo carriers had been destroyed. The enemy would, of course, have a very heavy reserve of fuel on hand. But there was no way of knowing how large it was, how many warships it could supply, or how long it would last. Two facts were, however, unquestionable. First, the Strets were building a fleet that in their minds would be invincible. Second, they would attack Ardane as soon as that fleet could be made ready. The unanswerable question was, how long would that take? So we want to get every ship we have. How many? Five thousand? Ten? Fifteen? We want them converted to maximum possible power as soon as we possibly can, Sawtell said. And I want to get out there with my boys to handle things. You aren't going to. Neither you nor your boys are expendable. Particularly you. Jaw hard set, Hilton studied the situation for minutes. No. What we'll do is take your omen, Keedy. We'll reset the guy to drive into him everything you and the military masters ever knew about arms, armament, strategy, tactics, and so on. And we'll add everything I know of coordination, synthesis, and perception. That ought to make him at least a junior-grade military genius. You can play that in spades. I wish you could do it to me. I can, if you'll take the full omen transformation. Nothing else can stand the punishment. I know. No, I don't want to be a genius that badly. Check. And we'll take the resultant Keedy and make nine duplicates of him. Each one will learn from and profit by the mistakes made by preceding numbers, and will assume command the instant his preceding number is killed. Oh, you expect, then? Expect? No. I know it damn well, and so do you. That's why we Ardens will all stay aground. Why, the Keedy's first job will be to make the heavy stuff in and around Ardane as heavy as it can be made. Why, it'll all be on twenty-four-hour alert. Then they can put as many thousands of omens as you please to work at modernizing all the omen ships you want and doing anything else you say. Check? Saltel thought for a couple of minutes. A few details is all. But that can be ironed out as we go along. Both men worked then almost unremittingly for six solid days, at the end of which time both drew tremendous sighs of relief. They had done everything possible for them to do. The defense of Ardvor was now rolling at fullest speed toward its gigantic objective. Then Captain and Director, in two omen ships with fifty men and a thousand omens, leapt the world-girdling ocean to the mining operation of the Strets. There they found business strictly as usual. The strippers still stripped. The mining mechs roared and snarled their inch-wise ways along their geometrically perfect terraces. The little carriers still skittered busily between the various miners and the storage silos. The fact that there was enough concentrate on hand to last a world for a hundred years made no difference at all to these automatics. A crew of erector mechs was building new silos as fast as existing ones were being filled. Since the men now understood everything that was going on, it was a simple matter for them to stop the whole Strat operation in its tracks. Then every man and every omen leapt to his assigned job. Three days later, all the mechs went back to work. Now, however, they were working for the Ardens. The miners, instead of concentrate, now emitted vastly larger streams of Navy Standard pelleted uranexite. The carriers, instead of one-gallon cans, carried five-ton drums. The silos were immensely larger, thirty feet in diameter and towering two hundred feet into the air. The silos were not, however, being used as yet. One of the two omen ships had been converted into a fuel tanker and its yawning holds were being filled first. The Orion went back to Ardane and an eight-day wait began. For the first time in over seven months Hilton found time actually to loaf and he and Temple, lolling on the beach or hiking in the mountains, enjoyed themselves and each other to the full. All too soon, however, the heavily laden tanker appeared in the sky over Ardane. The Orion joined it, and the two ships slipped into subspace for Earth. Three days out, Hilton used his sense of perception to release the thought-controlled blocks that had been holding all the controls of the Perseus in neutral. He informed her officers, by releasing a public address tape, 
that they were now free to return to Terra. Three days later, one day short of Saul, Sawtell got five-jet Admiral Gordon's office on the subspace radio. An officious underling tried to block him, of course. "'Shut up, Perkins, and listen,' Sawtell said brusquely. Tell Gordon I'm bringing in 120,245 metric tons of pelleted uranexite. And if he isn't on this beam in sixty seconds, he'll never get a gram of it. The Admiral, outraged almost to the point of apoplexy, came in. Sawtell, report yourself for court-martial at— Keep still, Gordon, the captain snapped. In sheer astonishment, the old five jets obeyed. I am no longer Terran Navy no longer subject to your orders. As a matter of cold fact, I am no longer human. For reasons which I will explain later to the full advisory board, some of the personnel of Project Theta Orionis underwent transformation into a form of life able to live in an environment of radioactivity so intense as to kill any human being in ten seconds. Under certain conditions, we will supply, free of charge, FOB Terra or Luna, all the uranexite the solar system can use. The conditions are these. And he gave them. Do you accept these conditions, or not? I... I would vote to accept them, Captain. But that weight! One hundred twenty thousand metric tons? Incredible! Are you sure of that figure? Definitely. And that is minimum. The error is plus, not minus. This crippling power shortage would really be over? For the first time since Sawtell had known him, Gordon showed that he was not quite solid navy brass. It's over, definitely, for good. I'd not only agree, I'd raise you a monument. While I can't speak for the board, I'm sure they'll agree. So am I. In any event, your cooperation is all that's required for this first load. The chips had vanished from Sawtell's shoulders. Where do you want it, Admiral? Aristarchus or White Sands? White Sands, please. While there may be some delay in releasing it to industry, while they figure out how much they can tax it? Sawtell asked sardonically. Well, if they don't tax it, it'll be the first thing in history that isn't. Have you any objections to releasing all this to the press? Not at all. The harder they hit it, and the wider they spread it, the better. Will you have this beam switched to astrogation, please? Of course, and thanks, Captain. I'll see you at White Sands. Then, as the now positively glowing Gordon faded away, Sawtell turned to his own staff. Fenway, Snowden, take over. Better double-check microtiming with Astro. Put us into a twenty-four-hour orbit over White Sands and hold us there. We won't go down. Let the load down on remote, wherever they want it. The arrival of the Ardvorian super-dreadnought Orion and the UC-1, your inexcite carrier number one, was one of the most sensational events old Earth had ever known. Air and spacecraft went clear out to Emergence Volume 90 to meet them. By the time the UC-1 was coming in on its remote-controlled landing spiral, the press of small ships was so great that all the police forces available were in a lather trying to control it. This was exactly what Hilton had wanted. It made possible the completely unobserved launching of several dozen small craft from the Orion herself. One of these made a very high and very fast flight to Chicago. With all due formality and under the aegis of a perfectly authentic registry number, it landed on O'Hare Field. Eleven deeply tanned young men emerged from it and made their way to a taxi stand where each engaged a separate vehicle. Sam Bryant stepped into his cab, gave the driver a number on Oakwood Avenue in De Plain, and settled back to scan. He was lucky. He would have gone anywhere she was, of course, but the way things were, he could give her a little warning to soften the shock. She had taken the baby out for an airing down by River Road and was on her way back. By having the taxi killed ten minutes or so, he could arrive just after she did. Wherefore, he stopped the cab at a public communications booth and dialed his home. Mrs. Bryant is not at home, but she will return at 15.30, the instrument said crisply. Would you care to record a message for her? He punched the record button. This is Sam, Dolly Baby. I'm right behind you. 
Turn around, way, don't you, and tell your ever-loving, star-hopping husband hello. The taxi pulled up at the curb just as Doris closed the front door, and Sam, after handing the driver a five-dollar bill, ran up the walk. He waited just outside the door, key in hand, while she lowered the stroller handle, took off her hat, and by long-established habit, reached out to flip the communicator's switch. At the first word, however, she stiffened rigidly, froze solid. Smiling, he opened the door, walked in, and closed it behind him. Nothing short of a shotgun blast could have taken Doris Bryant's attention from that recorder then. "'That simply is not so,' she told the instrument firmly, with both eyes resolutely shut. "'They made him stay on the Perseus. He won't be in for at least three days. This is some Cretan's idea of a joke.' "'Not this time, Dolly, honey. It's really me.' Her eyes popped open as she whirled. "'Sam!' she shrieked, and hurled herself at him with all the pent-up ardor and longing of two hundred thirty-four meticulously counted, husbandless, loveless days. After an unknown length of time, Sam tipped her face up by the chin, nodded at the stroller, and said, "'How about introducing me to the little stranger?' "'What a mother I turned out to be!' That was the first thing I was going to rave about, the very first thing I saw you. Samuel J. the Fourth, seventy-six days old today, and so on. Eventually, however, the proud young mother watched the slightly apprehensive young father carry their firstborn upstairs, where together they put him, still sound asleep, to bed in his crib. Then again they were in each other's arms. Some time later she twisted around in the circle of his arm and tried to dig her fingers into the muscles of his back. She then attacked his biceps and, leaning backward, eyed him intently. "'You're you, I know, but you're different. No athlete or any laborer could ever possibly get the muscles you have all over, to say nothing of a space officer on duty. And I know it isn't any kind of a disease. You've been acting all the time as though I were fragile.' made out of glass or something, as though you were afraid of breaking me in two. So what is it, sweetheart? I've been trying to figure out an easy way of telling you, but there isn't any. I am different. I'm a hundred times as strong as any man ever was. Look. He upended a chair, took one heavy hardwood leg between finger and thumb, and made what looked like a gentle effort to bend it. The leg broke with a pistol-sharp report and Doris leapt backward in surprise. So, you're right. I am afraid. Not only of breaking you in two, but killing you. And if I break any of your ribs or arms or legs, I'll never forgive myself. So, if I let myself go for a second, I don't think I will, but I might. Don't wait until you're really hurt to start screaming. Promise? I promise. Her eyes went wide. But tell me. He told her. She was in turn surprised, amazed, apprehensive, frightened, and finally eager, and she became more and more eager right up to the end. You mean that we, that I'll stay just as I am for thousands of years? Just as you are, or different if you like. If you really mean any of this yelling you've been doing about being too big in the hips, I think you're exactly right myself. You can rebuild yourself any way you please or change your shape every hour on the hour. But you haven't accepted my invitation yet. Don't be silly. She went into his arms again and nibbled on his left ear. I'd go anywhere with you, of course, any time. But this, but you're positively sure Sammy Small will be all right? Positively sure. Okay, I'll call Mother. Her face fell. I can't tell her that we'll never see them again, and that we'll live. You don't need to. She and Pop, Fern and Sally, too, and their boyfriends, are on the list. Not this time, but in a month or so, probably. Doris brightened like a sunburst. And your folks, too, of course? she asked. Yes, all the close ones. Marvelous. How soon are we leaving? At six o'clock next morning, Two hundred thirty-five days after leaving Earth, Hilton and Sautel set out to make the Ardens' official call upon the Terra's advisory board. Both were wearing prodigiously heavy lead armor, 
the inside of which was furiously radioactive. They did not need it, of course, but it would make all Ardens monstrous in Terran eyes and would conceal the fact that any other Ardens were landing. Their gig was met at the spaceport, not by a limousine, but by a five-ton truck, into which they were loaded one at a time by a hydraulic lift. Cameras clicked, reporters scurried, and tridy scanners whirred. One of those scanners, both men knew, was reporting directly and only to the advisory board, which, of course, never took anything either for granted or at its face value. Their first stop was at a truck scale, where each visitor was weighed. Hilton tipped the beam at 4,615 pounds. Sautel, a smaller man, weighed in at 4,190 thence to the radiation laboratory, where it was ascertained and reported that the armor did not leak, which was reasonable enough since each was lined with master's plastics. Then into lead-lined testing cells, where each opened his face plate briefly to a sensing element, whereupon the indicating needles of two meters in the main laboratory went enthusiastically through the full range of red and held unwaveringly against their stops. Both Ardens felt the wave of shocked, astonished, almost unbelieving consternation that swept through the observing scientists, and in slightly lesser measure, because they knew less about radiation, through the advisory board itself in a big room halfway across town. And from the radiation laboratory they were taken, via truck and freight elevator, to the office of the Commandant, where the board was sitting. The story, which had been sent in to the board the day before on a scrambled beam, was one upon which the Ardens had labored for days. Many facts could be withheld. However, every man aboard the Perseus would agree on some things. Indeed, the Earth ship's communications officers had undoubtedly radioed in early about longevity and perfect health, and omen service and many other matters. Hence all such things would have to be admitted and countered. Thus the report, while it was airtight, perfectly, logically, perfectly consistent, and apparently complete, did not please the board at all. It wasn't intended to. "'We cannot and do not approve of such unwarranted favoritism,' the chairman of the board said. "'Longevity has always been man's prime goal. Every human being has the inalienable right to—' "'Flapdoodle,' Hilton snorted. "'This is not being broadcast, and the room is proofed. So please, climb down off your soapbox.' You don't need to talk like a politician here. Didn't you read paragraph 12A2, one of the many marked top secret? Of course, but we do not understand how purely mental qualities can possibly have any effect upon purely physical transformations. Thus, it does not seem reasonable that any except rigorously screened personnel would die in the process. That is, of course, unless you contemplate deliberate, cold-blooded murder— that stopped Hilton in his tracks, for it was too close for comfort to the truth. But it did not hold the captain for an instant. He was used to death in many of its grisliest forms. "'There are a lot of things no Terran ever will understand,' Sautel replied instantly. "'Reasonable or not, that's exactly what will happen. And reasonable or not, it will be suicide, not murder. There isn't a thing that either Hilton or I can do about it.' Hilton broke the ensuing silence. "'You can say with equal truth that every human being has the right to run a four-minute mile, or to compose a great symphony. It isn't a matter of right at all, but of ability. In this case, the mental qualities are even more necessary than the physical. You as a board did a very fine job of selecting the Busai personnel for Project Theta Orionis. Almost eighty percent of them proved able to withstand the Arden conversion.' On the other hand, only a very small percentage of the Navy personnel did so. Your report said the remaining personnel of the project were not informed as to the death aspect of the transformation, Admiral Gordon said. Why not? That should be self-explanatory, Hilton said flatly. They are still human and still Terrans. We did not and will not encroach upon either the duties or the privileges of Terra's advisory board. What you tell all Terrans, and how much and how, must be decided by yourselves. This also applies, of course, to the other top-secret paragraphs of the report, none of which are known to any Terran outside the board. 
"'But you haven't said anything about the method of selection,' another adviser complained. "'Why, that will take all the psychologists of the world working full-time continuously.' "'We said we would do the selecting. We meant just that,' Hilton said coldly. "'No one except the very few selectees will know anything about it. Even if it were an unmixed blessing, which it very definitely is not, do you want all humanity thrown into such an uproar as that would cause? Or the quite possible racial inferiority complex it might set up? To say nothing of the question of how much of Terra's best blood do you want to drain off, irreversibly and permanently? No. What we suggest is that you paint the picture so black, using Sautel and me and what all humanity has just seen as horrible examples, that nobody would take it as a gift. Make them shun it like the plague. Hell, I don't have to tell you what your propaganda machines can do." The chairman of the board again mounted his invisible rostrum. "'Do you mean to intimate that we are to falsify the record?' he declaimed. "'To try to make liars out of hundreds of eyewitnesses? You ask us to distort the truth, to connive at—' "'We aren't asking you to do anything,' Hilton snapped. "'We don't give a damn what you do. Just study that record, with all that it implies. Read between the lines. As for those on the Perseus, no two of them will tell the same story, and not one of them has even the remotest idea of what the real story is. I, personally, not only did not want to become a monster, but would have given everything I had to stay human. My wife felt the same way. Neither of us would have converted if there had been any other way in God's universe of getting the uranexite and doing some other things that simply must be done. "'What other things?' Gordon demanded. "'You'll never know,' Hilton answered quietly. "'Things no Terran ever will know, we hope. Things that would drive any Terran stark mad. Some of them are hinted at, as much as we dared, between the lines of the report.' The report had not mentioned the Strets, nor were they to be mentioned now. If the Ardents could stop them, no Terran need ever know anything about them. If not, no Terran should know anything about them except what he would learn for himself just before the end, for Terra would never be able to do anything to defend herself against the Strets. "'Nothing whatever can drive me mad,' Gordon declared, "'and I want to know all about it, right now.' "'You can do one of two things, Gordon,' Sawtell said in disgust. His sneer was plainly visible through the six-ply, plastic-backed lead glass of his faceplate. "'Either shut up, or accept my personal invitation to come to Ardvor and try to go through the ringer. That's an invitation to your own funeral.' Five-Jet Admiral Gordon, torn inwardly to ribbons, made no reply. "'I repeat,' Hilton went on, "'we are not asking you to do anything whatever.' We are offering to give you, free of charge but under certain conditions, all the power your humanity can possibly use. We set no limitation whatever as to quantity and with no foreseeable limit as to time. The only point at issue is whether or not you accept the conditions. If you do not accept them, we'll leave now, and the offer will not be repeated. And you would, I presume, take the UC-1 back with you? Of course not, sir. Terran needs power too badly. You are perfectly welcome to that one load of uranexite, no matter what is decided here. That is one way of putting it, Gordon sneered. But the truth is that you know damned well I'll blow both of your ships out of space if you so much as— Oh, chip-chop the jaw-flapping, Gordon, Hilton snapped. Then, as the Admiral began to bellow orders into his microphone, he went on. You want it the hard way, eh? Watch what happens, all of you. The UC-1 shot vertically into the air, through its shallow dense layer and into and through the stratosphere. Earth's fleet, already on full alert and poised to strike, rushed to the attack. But the carrier had reached the Orion and both Ardvorian ships had been waiting, motionless, for a good half-minute before the Terran warships arrived and began to blast with everything they had. Flashlights and firecrackers, Saltel said calmly. You aren't even warming up our screens. As soon as you quit making a damn fool of yourself by wasting energy that way, we'll set the UC-1 back down where she was and get on with our business here. 
You will order a ceasefire at once, Admiral, the chairman said or the rest of us will, as of now, remove you from the board." Gordon gritted his teeth in rage, but gave the order. "'If he hasn't had enough yet to convince him,' Hilton suggested, "'he might send up a drone. We don't want to kill anybody, you know. One with the heaviest screening he's got, just to see what happens to it.' "'He's had enough. The rest of us have had more than enough. That exhibition was not only uncalled for and disgusting, it was outrageous. The meeting settled down then from argument to constructive discussion, and many topics were gone over. Certain matters were, however, so self-evident that they were not even mentioned. Thus it was a self-evident fact that no Terran could ever visit Ardvor, for the instrument readings agreed with the report's statements as to the violence of the Ardvorian environment, and no Terran could possibly walk around in two tons of lead. Conversely, it was self-apparent to the Terrans that no Arden could ever visit Earth without being recognized instantly for what he was. Wearing such armor made its necessity starkly plain. No one from the Perseus could say that any Arden, after having lived on the furiously radiant surface of Ardvor, would not be as furiously radioactive as the laboratory's calibrated instruments had shown Hilton and Sawtell actually to be wherefore the conference went on, quietly and cooperatively, to its planned end. One minute after the Terran battleship Perseus emerged into normal space, the Orion went into subspace for her long trip back to Ardvor. The last two days of that seven-day trip were the longest seeming that either Hilton or Sautel had ever known. The subspace radio was on continuously, and Keedy One reported to Sautel every five minutes. Even though Hilton knew that the Omen Commander-in-Chief was exactly as good at perceiving as he himself was, he found himself scanning the thoroughly screened Strett world forty or fifty times an hour. However, in spite of worry and apprehension, time wore eventlessly on. The Orion emerged, went to Ardvor, and landed on Ardain Field. Hilton, after greeting properly and reporting to his wife, went to his office. There he found that Sandra had everything well in hand, except for a few tapes that only he could handle. Sawtell and his officers went to the new Command Central, where everything was rolling smoothly and very much faster than Sawtell had dared hope. The Terran immigrants had to live in the Orion, of course, until conversion into Ardens. Almost equally, of course, since the Bryant infant was the only young baby in the lot, Doris and her Sammy Small were, by popular acclaim, the first batch to be converted. For little Sammy had taken the entire feminine contingent by storm. No omen female had a chance to act as nurse as long as any of the girls were around, which was practically all the time, especially the platinum blonde twins, for several months now Bernadine Braden and Hermione Felger. "'And you said they were so hard-boiled,' Dora said accusingly to Sam, nodding at the twins. On hands and knees on the floor, head to head with Sammy Small between them, they were growling deep-throated at each other and nuzzling at the baby, who was having the time of his young life. "'You couldn't have been more wronger, my sweet, if you'd had the whole octagon helping you go astray. They're just as nice as they can be, both of them.' Sam shrugged and grinned. His wife strode purposefully across the room to the playful pair and lifted their pretended prey out from between them. "'Quit it, you two, she directed, swinging the baby up and depositing him astraddle her left hip. "'You're just simply spoiling him rotten.' "'You think so, Dolly? Uh-uh. Far be it from such.' Bernadine came lightly to her feet. She glanced at her own taut, trim abdomen, upon which a micrometrically precise topographical mapping job might have revealed an otherwise imperceptible bulge. "'Just you wait until Junior arrives,' and I'll show you how to really spoil a baby. Besides, what's the hurry? He needs his supper, vitamins and minerals and hard radiations and things, and then he's going to bed. I don't approve of this no-sleep business, so run along, both of you, until tomorrow. End of chapter 11
of Masters of Space by E. E. Doc Smith and E. Everett Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Masters of Space, Chapter 12 As has been said, the Strets were working, with all the intensity of their monstrous but tremendously capable minds, upon their great plan, which was, basically, to conquer and either enslave or destroy every other intelligent race throughout all the length, breadth, and thickness of total space. To that end, each individual strat had to become invulnerable and immortal. Wherefore, in the inconceivably remote past, there had been put into effect a program of selective breeding and of carefully calculated treatments. It was mathematically certain that this program would result in a race of beings of pure force, beings having no material constituents remaining whatever. Under those hellish treatments, billions upon billions of strats had died, but the few remaining thousands had almost reached their sublime goal. In a few more hundreds of thousands of years, perfection would be reached. The few surviving hundreds of perfect beings could and would multiply to any desired number in practically no time at all. Hilton and his seven fellow workers had perceived all this in their one and only study of the planet Strett, and every other Arden had been completely informed. A dozen or so Strett lords of thought, male and female, were floating about in the atmosphere, which was not air, of their assembly hall. Their heads were globes of ball lightning. Inside them could be seen quite plainly the intricate convolutions of immense, less than half material brains, shot through and through with rods and pencils and shapes of pure, scintillating force. And the bodies, or rather, each horrendous brain, had a few partially material appendages and appurtenances recognizable as bodily organs. There were no mouths, no ears, no eyes, no noses or nostrils no lungs, no legs or arms. There were, however, hearts. Some partially material ichor flowed through those living fire outline tubes. There were starkly functional organs of reproduction with which, by no stretch of the imagination, could any thought of tenderness or love be connected. It was a good thing for the race Hilton had thought at first perception of the things, that the Strets had bred out of themselves every iota of finer, higher attributes of life. If they had not done so, the importance of sheer disgust would have supervened so long since that the race would have been extinct for ages. Thirty-eight periods ago, the great brain was charged with the sum total of Stretzian knowledge, first Lord Thinker Zoyar radiated to the assembled Strets. For those thirty-eight periods— it has been scanning, peondiring, amassing data, and formulating hypotheses, theories, and conclusions. It has just informed me that it is now ready to make a preliminary report. Great brain, how much of the total universe have you studied? This galaxy only, the brain radiated, in a texture of thought as hard and as harsh as Zoyar's own. Why not more? Insufficient power. My first conclusion is that whoever set up the specifications for me is a fool. To say that the First Lord went out of control at this statement is to put it very mildly indeed. He fulminated, ending with, Destroyed instantly! Destroy me if you like, came the utterly calm, utterly cold reply. I am in no sense alive. I have no consciousness of self, nor any desire for continued existence. To do so, however, would— A flurry of activity interrupted the thought. Zoyar was, in fact, assembling the forces to destroy the brain. But before he could act, Second Lord Thinker Inos and another female blew him into a mixture of loose molecules and flaring energies. Destruction of any kind in all irrational minds is mandatory— Inos, now first Lord Thinker, explained to the linked minds. Zoyar had been becoming less and less rational by the period. A good workman does not causelessly destroy his tools. Go ahead, great brain, with your findings. Not be logical. The brain resumed the thought exactly where it had been broken off. Zoyar erred in demanding unlimited performance, 
since infinite knowledge and infinite ability require not only infinite capacity and infinite power, but also infinite time. Nor is it either necessary or desirable that I should have such qualities. There is no reasonable basis for the assumption that you Strets will conquer any significant number even of the millions of intelligent races now inhabiting this one galaxy. Why not? Inos demanded, her thought almost, but not quite, as steady and cold as it had been. The answer to that question is implicit in the second indefensible error made in my construction. The prime datum impressed into my banks that the Strets are in fact the strongest, ablest, most intelligent race in the universe proved to be false. I had to eliminate it before I could do any real constructive thinking. A roar of condemnatory thought brought all circumambient ether to a boil. Bah! Destroy it! Detestable! Intolerable! If that is the best it can do, annihilate it! Far better brains have been destroyed for much less! Treason! And so on. First Lord Thinker Inos, however, remained relatively calm. While we have always held it to be a fact that we are the highest race in existence, no rigorous proof has been possible. Can you now disprove that assumption? I have disproved it. I have not had time to study all of the civilizations of this galaxy, but I have examined a statistically adequate sample of 1,792,416 different planetary intelligences. I found one which is considerably abler and more advanced than you Strets. Therefore, the probability is greater than point nine nine that there are not less than ten, and not more than two hundred eight such races in this galaxy alone. Impossible! Another wave of incredulous and threatening anger swept through the linked minds, a wave which Inos flattened out with some difficulty. Then she asked, Is it probable that we will make contact with this supposedly superior race in the foreseeable future? You are in contact with it now. What? Even Inos was contemptuous now. You mean that one shipload of despicable humans, who, far too late to do them any good, barred us temporarily from the fuel world? Not exactly, or only those humans know, and your assumptions may or not be valid. Don't you know whether they are or not? Inos snapped. Explain your uncertainty at once. I am uncertain because of insufficient data, the brain replied calmly. The only pertinent facts of which I am certain are, first, the world Ardri, upon which the omens formerly lived, and to which the humans in question first went, a planet which no Strett can pay on dire, is now abandoned. Second, the Strets of old did not completely destroy the humanity of the world Ardu. Third, some escapees from Ardu reached and populated the world Ardri. Fourth, the android omens were developed on Ardri by the human escapees from Ardu and their descendants. Fifth, the omens refer to those humans as masters. Sixth, after living on Ardri for a very long period of time, the masters went elsewhere. Seventh, the omens remaining in Ardri maintained continuously and for a very long time the status quo left by the masters. Eighth, immediately upon the arrival from Terra of those present humans, that long-existing status was broken. Ninth, the planet called Fuel World is, for the first time, surrounded by a screen of force. The formula of this screen is as follows. The brain gave it. No Strett either complained or interrupted. Each was too busy studying that formula and examining its stunning implications and connotations. Tenth, that formula is one full order of magnitude beyond anything previously known to your science. Eleventh, it could not have been developed by the science of Terra, nor by that of any other world whose population I have examined. The brain took the linked minds instantaneously to Terra then to a few thousand or so other worlds inhabited by human beings, then to a few thousands of planets whose populations were near-human, non-human, and monstrous. "'It is therefore clear,' it announced, 
that this screen was computed and produced by the race, whatever it may be, that is now dwelling on Fuel World and asserting full ownership of it. Who or what is that race? Hynos demanded. Data insufficient. Theorize, then. Postulate that the Masters, in many thousands of cycles of study, made advances in science that were not reduced to practice. That the omens either possessed this knowledge or had access to it, and that omens and humans cooperated fully in sharing and in working with all the knowledge thus available. From these three postulates, the conclusion can be drawn that there has come into existence a new race, one combining the best qualities of both humans and omens, but with the weaknesses of neither. An unpleasant thought, truly, I know's thought. But you can now, I suppose, design the generators and projectors of a force superior to that screen. Data insufficient. I can equal it, since both generation and projection are implicit in the formula, but the data so adduced are in themselves vastly ahead of anything previously in my banks. Are there any other races in this galaxy more powerful than the postulated one now living on Fuel World? Data insufficient. Theorize, then. Data insufficient. The linked minds concentrated upon the problem for a period of time that might have been either days or weeks. Then, Great Brain, advise us, Aino said. What is best for us to do? With identical defensive screens, it becomes a question of relative power. You should increase the size and power of your warships to something beyond the computed probable maximum of the enemy. You should build more ships and missiles than they will probably be able to build. Then, and only then, will you attack their warships, in tremendous force and continuously. But not their planetary defenses. I see. Inos's thought was one of complete understanding. And the real offensive will be? No mobile structure can be built to mount mechanisms of power sufficient to smash down by sheer force of output such tremendously powerful installations as their planet-based defenses must be assumed to be. Therefore, the planet itself must be destroyed. This will require a missile of planetary mass. The best such missile is the tenth planet of their own sun. I see. Inos's mind was leaping ahead, considering hundreds of possibilities and making highly intricate and involved computations. That will, however, require many cycles of time and more power than even our immense reserves can supply. True, it will take much time. The fuel problem, however, is not a serious one, since fuel world is not unique. Think on first, Lord Inos. We will attack in maximum force and with maximum violence. We will blanket the planet. We will maintain maximum force and violence until most or all of the enemy ships have been destroyed. We will then install planetary drives on ten and force it into collision orbit with Fuel World, meanwhile exerting extreme precautions that not so much as a spy beam emerges above the enemy screen. Then, still maintaining extreme precaution, we will guard both planets until the last possible moment before the collision. Brain, it cannot fail. You err. It can fail. All we actually know of the abilities of this postulated neo-human race is what I have learned from the composition of its defensive screen. The probability approaches unity that the masters continue to delve and to learn for millions of cycles, while you stretch, reasonously certain of your supremacy, concentrated upon your evolution from the material to a non-material form of life, and performed only limited research into armaments of greater and ever greater power. True, but that attitude was then justified. It was not and is not logical to assume that any race would establish a fixed status at any level of ability below its absolute maximum. While that conclusion could once have been defensible, it is now virtually certain that the masters had stores of knowledge which they may or may not have withheld from the omens, but which were in some way made available to the neo-humans. Also, 
there is no basis whatever for the assumption that this new race has revealed all its potentialities. Statistically, that is probably true, but this is the best plan you have been able to formulate? It is. Of the many thousands of plans I set up and tested, this one has the highest probability of success. Then we will adopt it. We are Strets. Whatever we decide upon will be driven through to complete success. We have one tremendous advantage in you. Yes, the probability approaches unity that I can perform research on a vastly wider and larger scale, and almost infinitely faster than can any living organism or any possible combination of such organisms. Nor was the great brain bragging. It scanned in moments the stored scientific knowledge of over a million planets. It tabulated, correlated, analyzed, synthesized, theorized, and concluded, all in microseconds of time. Thus it made more progress in one Terran week than the Masters had made in a million years. When it had gone as far as it could go, it reported its results, and the Strets, hard as they were and intransigent, were amazed and overjoyed. Not one of them had ever imagined such armaments possible. Hence they became supremely confident that it was unmatched and unmatchable throughout all space. What the great brain did not know, however, and the Strets did not realize, was that it could not really think. Unlike the human mind, it could not deduce valid theories or conclusions from incomplete, insufficient, fragmentary data. It could not leap gaps. Thus, there was no more actual assurance than before that they had exceeded, or even matched, the weaponry of the neo-humans of Fuel World. Supremely confident, Aino said, We will now discuss every detail of the plan in sub-detail, and will correlate every sub-detail with every other, to the end that every action, however minor, will be performed perfectly and in its exact time. That discussion, which lasted for days, was held. Hundreds of thousands of new and highly specialized mechs were built, and went furiously and continuously to work. A fuel supply line was run to another uranexite-rich planet. Stripping machines stripped away the surface layers of soil, sand, rock, and low-grade ore. Giant miners tore and dug and slashed and refined and concentrated. Storage silos by the hundreds were built and were filled. Hundreds upon hundreds of concentrate carriers bored their stolid ways through hyperspace. Many weeks of time passed. But of what importance are mere weeks of time to a race that has, for many millions of years, been adhering rigidly to a preset program? The sheer magnitude of the operation, and the extraordinary attention to detail with which it was prepared and launched, explained why the Strett attack on Arvor did not occur until so many weeks later than Hilton and Sawtell expected it. They also explained the utterly incomprehensible fury, the complete, fantastic intensity, the unparalleled savagery, the almost immeasurable brute power of that attack when it finally did come. When the Orion landed on Ardain Field from Earth, carrying the first contingent of immigrants, Hilton and Sawtell were almost as much surprised as relieved that the Strets had not already attacked. Sawtell, confident that his defenses were fully ready, took it more or less in stride. Hilton worried and after a couple of days he began to do some real thinking about it. The first result of his thinking was a conference with Temple. As soon as she got the drift, she called in Teddy and Big Bill Carnes. Teddy, in turn, called in Becky and DeVoe. Carnes wanted Pointer and Beverly. Pointer wanted Braden and the twins, and so on. Thus, what started out as a conference of two became a full ardent staff meeting, a meeting which, starting immediately after lunch, ran straight through into the following afternoon. To sum up the consensus for the record, Hilton said then, studying a sheet of paper covered with symbols, the Strets haven't attacked yet because they found out that we are stronger than they are. They found that out by analyzing our defensive web, which, if we had had this meeting first, we wouldn't have put up at all. Unlike anything known to human or previous Strets science, it is proof against any form of attack up to the limit of the power of its generators. They will attack as soon as they are equipped to break that screen at the level of power probable to our ships. 
we cannot arrive at any reliable estimate as to how long that will take. As to the effectiveness of our cutting off their known fuel supply, opinion is divided. We must therefore assume that fuel shortage will not be a factor. Neither are we unanimous on the basic matter as to why the masters acted as they did just before they left Ardree. Why did they set the status so far below their top ability? Why did they make it impossible for the omens ever, of themselves, to learn their higher science? Why, if they did not want that science to become known, did they leave complete records of it? The majority of us believe that the masters coded their records in such fashion that the Strets, even if they conquered the omens or destroyed them, could never break that code, since it was key to the basic difference between the Strett mentality and the human. Thus they left it deliberately for some human race to find. Finally, and most important, our physicists and theoreticians are not able to extrapolate, from the analysis of our screen, to the concepts underlying the master's ultimate weapons of offense, the first stage booster and its final end product, the Vang. If, as we can safely assume, the Strets do not already have those weapons, they will know nothing about them until we ourselves use them in battle. These are, of course, only the principal points covered. Does anyone wish to amend this summation as recorded? No one did. The meeting was adjourned. Hilton, however, accompanied Sautel and Keedy to the captain's office. So, you see, Skipper, we got troubles, he said. If we don't use those boosters against their skeletons, it'll boil down to a stalemate lasting God only knows how long. It will be a war of attrition, outcome dependent on which side can build the most and biggest and strongest ships the fastest. On the other hand, if we do use them on defense here, they'll analyze them and have everything worked out in a day or so. The first thing they'll do is beef up their planetary defenses to match. That way, we'd blow all their ships out of space, probably easily enough, but Strett itself will be just as safe as though it were in God's left-hand hip pocket. So what's the answer? It isn't that simple, Jarve, Sawtell said. Let's hear from you, Keedy. Thank you, sir. There is an optimum mass, a point of maximum efficiency of firepower as balanced against loss of maneuverability for any craft designed for attack. Keedy thought in his most professional manner. We assume that the Strets know that as well as we do. No such limitation applies to strictly defensive structures, but both the Strett craft and ours must be designed for attack. We have built and are building many hundreds of thousands of ships of that type. So, undoubtedly, are the Strets. Ship for ship, they will be pretty well matched. Therefore, one part of my strategy will be for two of our ships to engage simultaneously one of theirs. There is a distinct probability that we will have enough advantage in speed of control to make that tactic operable. But there's another that we won't, Sawtell objected, and maybe they can build more ships than we can. Another point is that they may build, in addition to their big stuff, a lot of small, ultra-fast ones, Hilton put in. Suicide jobs crash and detonate, simply super-missiles. How sure are you that you can stop such missiles with ordinary beams? Not at all, sir. Some of them would of course reach and destroy some of our ships. Which brings up the second part of my strategy. For each one of the heavies, we are building many small ships of the type you just called super-missiles. Super-dreadnoughts versus super-dreadnoughts. Super-missiles versus super-missiles. Hilton digested that concept for several minutes. That could still wind up as a stalemate, except for what you said about control. That isn't much to depend on, especially since we won't have the time-like advantage you omens had before. They'll see to that. Also, I don't like to sacrifice a million omens either. I haven't explained the newest development yet, sir. There will be no omens. Each ship and each missile has a built-in keedy brain, sir. What? That makes it infinitely worse. You Keedies, unless it's absolutely necessary, are not expendable. Oh, but we are, sir. You don't quite understand. We Keedies are not merely similar, but are in fact identical. Thus we are not independent entities. All of us together make up the actual Keedy, that which is met when we say I. 
That is, I am the sum total of all Kiddies everywhere, not merely this individual that you call Kiddie One. You mean you're all talking to me? Exactly, sir. Thus, no one element of the Kiddie has any need of, or any desire for, self-preservation. The destruction of one element, or of thousands of elements, would be of no more consequence to the Kiddy than, well, they are strictly analogous to the severed ends of the hairs each time you get a haircut. My God! Hilton stared at Sawtell. Sawtell stared back. I'm beginning to see. Maybe. I hope. What control that would be! But just in case we should have to use the boosters... Hilton's voice died away. Scowling in concentration, he clasped his hands behind his back and began to pace the floor. "'Better give up, Jarve. kitty has got the same mind you have,' Sawtell began, to Hilton's oblivious back. But Keedy silenced the thought almost in the moment of its inception. "'By no means, sir,' he contradicted. "'I have the brain only. The mind is entirely different.' "'Link up, Keedy, and see what you think of this,' Hilton broke in. There ensued an interchange of thought so fast and so deeply mathematical that Sawtell was lost in seconds. "'Do you think it'll work?' "'I don't see how it can fail, sir. At what point in the action should it be put into effect? And will you call the time of initiation, or shall I?' "'Not until all their reserves are in action, or at worst, all of ours except that one task force.' Since you'll know a lot more about the status of the battle than either Sawtell or I will, you will give the signal, and I'll start things going. "'What are you two talking about?' Sawtell demanded. "'It's a long story, chum. Katie can tell you about it better than I can. Besides, it's getting late, and Dark Lady and Larry both give me hell every time I hold supper on plus time, unless there's a mighty good reason for it. So, so long, guys.' End of chapter 12